shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Romans, the epistle of Paul to the Roman church, chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17, and the title of the message today in Romans is going to be Freedom and Family. Great topics. Freedom in Christ and the family that we have with God. We've come a long way so far with this book of Romans. Uh, Paul wrote to uh, the Roman church. He had not been there. He had not met most of them. They were mostly Jewish that he was writing to. And he talked about uh, some hard messages. Um, And uh, we, uh, they're they're hard messages today. Uh, We've been on the, um, on Facebook for quite a long time now. And I guess we- uh, Or banned. Yeah, we, we've been banned, um, banned in Boston, I have to as call them, and I have to do some kind of contract, which I'm not really interested in doing. No. Uh, and all <laughs> we do in this ministry, we, we were not, I'm not a preacher, nor is Kelly. I'm just, uh, uh, I just explain the Bible, just like Ezra did. I just kind of read it and explain it. Got into chapter one, talked about uh, uh, some issues, and uh, not just, didn't preach on that uh, topic, but I got into... Uh, uh, the sexual deviations, and that was it. Boom. So we are now banned. And it comes up, uh, but we can't share it to like thousands you can of see people it, but you can't that we share could it. before. Just for our, share our immediate a, yeah. um, audience, you can't do any kind of advertising, expand into other areas yeah. like we had been doing. Yeah, we, we were reaching out to the West Coast. and uh, It's called boosting. We can't cetera, boost. So, so they, they don't want it anyway. But, but God's going to find a different way, isn't he? He always does. Uh, I'm going to tell you a quick story, and then I shared with these folks beforehand. Uh, Sandy made the comment about COVID. has got a way of getting the word out without you even knowing about it. And uh, I have to be honest with you. I had a heart's desire when I first got saved. Uh, I never wanted to be a pastor. I, I wanted to be a teacher in a seminary, and God never allowed me to do that. That was never uh, his plan. So I pretty much put it aside and moved on, and I've enjoyed pastoring and enjoyed uh, the interaction over these last 40 years. Uh, but I got an email on Friday uh, from a man who uh, indicated that he is taking my courses in seminary. And I said, what? He said, yes, the seminary that I go to uh, has your courses in the Master of Divinity level and the doctoral level. I said, you're kidding. He said, I've never heard of these folks. It's called the International Christian College and Seminary, which is focused for those who want to move on with their degrees uh, online, but also especially to prison ministries and to prisoners. And that was also a heart uh, throb of mine to reach prisoners for Christ. And so he said, I'm taking your courses. My last two courses in the Master of Divinity is going to be uh, 60 of your sermons. Uh, they sent me 200 of them. I was listening to a lady in uh, Yale who was getting off into science and liberalism and all. And I said, give me somebody more conservative. So they sent me your stuff. And he said, I love it. And he's watching our videos, watching Kelly, etc. So I, I said, that when I die, I die happy that I had a chance to, to do a little seminary work along the line. All glory to God. He opens up doors you never would expect. Never would expect. And so uh, these folks never contacted me, probably never will. And there's no problem. I'm happy to get the word out. It's in public domain. But um, for those of you who are watching or part of that uh, university or what have you, I would encourage you, these dear folks here have my notes. I have notes on the whole Bible as well as sermons. But go to our website, reachoutfellowship.com, click on teachings, and then go to Jerry's teachings, and you'll see the notes on all of these sermons, and you'll be able to to follow along with us. Today we're talking about uh, freedom and family, and we're going to read verses 1 to 17, and Kelly's going to open us in prayer. Sure. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come here today. We ask that you would be with Pastor and I now as we bring forth your word. Help us, Lord, to have the wisdom and understanding, prepare the hearts of those who are going to hear and those who will hear in the future, that we would all truly be changed by the word that we're about to hear. Help us to give it out to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. In Romans chapter 1, we talked about man's unrighteousness, 
how unrighteous we really are. And uh, uh, we don't like to hear that in the natural. And Facebook didn't like to hear it at all. Uh, that's what got us going. <laughs> we're respect. sinners. Yeah. So I guess we're doing something right. Romans chapter 2, we talked about God's judgment on sin. Uh, Romans chapter 3, we talked about God's provision for sin, which is, of course, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 4, we talked about God's righteousness, which is by faith. It's not by works, and it's not by rites and rituals. It's not by law. It's by faith and faith alone. Romans chapter 5 talks about righteousness and blessings that come from being born again. Chapter 6 talks about freedom from sin, that you can be free from sin through the power of God Amen. and the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter 7 talked about the conflict. Oh, that conflict that we have with sin. Paul talked about the good that I want to do, I, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? But we're going to say the answer, of course, always is Jesus Christ. I was looking up something on the internet about Romans 8, and, and I, I love the internet. It's got so many uh, uh, wonderful ways of studying the Word of God. And um, there was a question just asked in a very simple way, um, and there, there's all kinds of subjects. What is the meaning of Romans chapter 8? Hmm. Well, after I taught it about 12 or 14 times and read can it 100 times. Uh, no, I can't, but you can. Declares that those who are with Christ are more than conquerors. Those who are with God should not fear anything else of the world because God is greater than all things. He who gave his only son in order to save all humans will surely give those who have accepted Christ great things. That's Romans chapter 8. So we can close in prayer and go out and have coffee. All right. <laughs> or we can have a little more to say about it than that. Amen. Let's talk about uh, freedom and family. You know, in Jesus we are free in God. And we are the family of God. We all need to be free, don't we? We want to be free. We find that animals want to be free. We've got a couple of young puppies here that want to be free from the leash and free from restrictions. Yeah. You've got some young kids who want to be free from mama and me and what have you. And uh, freedom, but, but we have a desire to be free in, in a good sense, in a constructive sense, mm -hmm. and not be in bondage to self and sin and the world. Uh, and we need family. We all need family. And, uh, you know, family's important. When I, uh, my mother passed away in 2011, and that was it. My brother had passed on, my, my stepdad had, and uh, I had a couple of stepsisters that um, I have little contact with, but basically I had no family, and I didn't even know that that was important to me. I was bopping along doing my thing here, but God said, no, you're going to have a family. And he brought this beautiful lady into my life with her uh, six children and uh, grandkids and what have you, and my life has never been the same. <laughs> and so family is important to us. And uh, you're going to have family whether you like it or not. No, <laughs> no, families are going to be a blessing. Sometimes you have to ask God to change you, right? Lord, change me. That's a prayer I've had to use an awful lot to get adjusted for 71 years being a bachelor and suddenly in a family environment, adjustment for the family, having to put up with a bachelor who, who was old and curmudgeon in all of his ways. But God wants us to be in a family here. More importantly, a family, a spiritual family in Christ yes. here and hereafter. So we're going to see that we are a family of God. Two points to remember. We are free in God. We are the family of God. Uh, verses 1 through 11, we talk about being free in God. We are free from condemnation. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. We are free from the flesh. We are free from death. That's marvelous. You're free from those things when you're in Christ. Condemnation, sin, law, flesh, death. Let's begin, honey, with verse, uh, let's read Romans chapter 8, and let's begin with verse 1, and I'm going to have you read right down through verse 11, please. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sin, sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, enmity, enmity mm-hmm. against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So we are free in God, free from a number of things. First of all, let's read verse 1. We are free from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So when you're in Christ, you're walking according to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes inside of you when you become born again, and you're now walking in the Spirit. It doesn't mean we don't sin. We do sin, uh, but we then ask God for forgiveness for that sin, and He cleanses us, and He will not condemn us. He will not condemn us to the lake of fire. He will not condemn us by judging us to be eternally separated from Him. Uh, Now, there will be punishment for things we do wrong. There'll be judgments here, uh, and even the judgment seat of Christ hereafter with a loss of rewards. Uh, But that is like a loving parent working with a child who has to give the child a little time out, a little discipline. But you're not condemned. You're not separated from the Lord when you are in Christ. Well, I like to, I violated one of my principles. I always say, and this time I violated that, never start with verse one of a chapter, right? Never start with verse one. Go back a few verses and get a running start and continuity. So he talks here about the, uh, uh, the, in chapter 7, let's go back a little bit here. And here's this conflict we talked about in verse 18 of chapter 7 of Romans. Here's this conflict that we have in the, uh, in the spiritual life. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Go ahead. For the good that I will do, I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Let's go ahead. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So there's that conflict that we have, isn't it? I maintain that spiritually speaking, you and I should be schizophrenic. (laughs) (laughs) You've got two natures. You have an old nature and you have a new nature. You've got the old nature that always wants to sin and the new nature that always wants to please God. There's that warfare going on inside. Anybody have that problem? You don't have to raise your hand. Bill Bright said this. (laughs) I know, I do. Uh, Remember Bill Bright, if it was a Campus Crusade, talked about that conflict that we have. He said the old nature and the new nature is like a black dog and a white dog fighting within you. And he said, which one's going to win? The black dog or the white dog? Doesn't matter, whichever one you feed. Whichever one you feed. Even as a born-again believer, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, and you can be living out of the fleshly side of your life. Now, you're not condemned. You're not separated from the Lord. But if I'm standing behind you, reward time in heaven, I won't have to wait very long because there'll be not much coming your way. Uh, Very, very few rewards uh, for that and a life of misery and bondage down here to that sin. So he says there's a warfare. What's the answer? Self-help programs, 12-step programs. The answer is Jesus Christ. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Just turn to Jesus. So now he says, if you're in Christ, 
You are free. We saw the first freedom is you're free from condemnation, verse 1. Now the second freedom is you're free from sin. Let's look at verse 2 of Romans chapter 8. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you're free from sin, and we're going to see also you're free from that law. But here you're, the Holy Spirit's in you, the spirit of life. That's one of his descriptive names. He's the spirit of life, and that life is in Christ Jesus. And he has made me free from the law of sin and death. Has made me. When did he make me? Well, in my case, it was uh, 1978. But he actually made that for me well over 2,000 years ago at the cross. He freed me from sin. He freed me from death, that separation. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden, sinning with the eating of the fruit? And he had to turn them out of the garden, didn't they? Lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. Death is a blessing. The walking dead. Death is a blessing. It frees us from sin. Can you imagine if we lived forever in these sinful bodies? The walking dead. Horrible, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we are now free of sin. The power of sin is no longer there because Christ has taken that power away, destroyed principalities and powers uh, at the cross. Well, he says now in verses 3 and 4 that you're free from the law, the, the, the law that sent you to death, sent you into bondage, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we are also free from the law of Moses. Remember the law of Moses, 613 laws uh, gave us the heart of God, the requirements of God, but it also showed us we could not keep all of those. James tells us that if you violate one law, you violated them all. Uh, you have failed. And so uh, there is no way to get to heaven except by someone who is righteous, and that's Jesus Christ who had also had another way of getting to heaven. First of all, he was the son of God, but he never sinned. He never violated one law of God. So what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, the law was good, but my flesh is weak and I can't keep it. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So he gave us the law to show his, his standards, but we can't keep the law. So he then had to send his son to us in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning he was a human being who had the ability to sin. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Jesus had the capability to sin. There are those who think he couldn't. That is not true. He was a human being through his mother Mary, and he had the ability to sin, but he never sinned once. Think of that. Never did. Can you imagine being a brother or Even a sister as a child. of him? Can you imagine he's Even growing as a child. up and, and they're all getting time out. They're all going to the woodshed. They've all misbehaved. I don't think time out existed uh, then. <laughs> In a mother's eyes, time out always existed. <laughs> and he never sinned. The babies are, we love them. They're precious, but they're selfish. They're sinful. And human beings are sinful all the way through their lives. He never did once. He satisfied the law in two ways. One is he was sinless. Secondly, he took all of our sins upon himself, and that was the penalty of the law. You break the law, the penalty is death. He took all of that upon himself and died in our place. So we are free from condemnation. We are free from sin. We are free from the law. Verse 4 says, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we to have to walk are, in the Spirit. That's right. That means you've got to come to Christ. You've got to be not only yielded to Christ, but living under his direction. Can't go running with the hooligans. That's right, those hooligans. The hooligans, they're not only Irish, they're every denomination, every nationality has, <laughs> has bad guys, right? <laughs> so uh, it's according to the Spirit. And we need to not only come to the Lord and be in the Spirit in that sense of being born again, but you need to walk daily. Uh, be yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that means being under the control of the Holy Spirit. Are you spirit-filled? Paul talks about that to the Ephesians. There's a confusion in the body of Christ of what it means to be spirit-filled. It's not talking in tongues. Tongues is real. I've been speaking in tongues all my, my Christian life. And Paul says, I speak in tongues more than you all. And tongues is prayer and prophecy. And, uh, and it's wonderful. But 
when he talks about being filled in the Spirit, he means being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Mm. You can be talking in tongues and thinking vile thoughts. And so you're not controlled by the Spirit at that point. In your, you know, by your tongue, yes, but not by your thoughts. But be controlled in your life. Your thoughts, actions, reactions. And so it's all part of being free. You're free from the law, verses 3 and 4. You're also free from the flesh, meaning the sinful side of your life, verses 5 through 9. Let's read those again, honey. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because so, yeah, go ahead, let, let, let finish okay. that out to verse Because nine. the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he is not his. All right. Whoa. So the flesh here does not mean this physical flesh uh, outside of our bodies, but it really means the sinful side of our lives. Verse 5, those who live. That's a continual course of conduct. Now, we all sin. And we make mistakes. But it should be sporadic, and it should be immediately confessed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. But when you're living that way, you're dwelling in that sinful lifestyle. Those who live according to your fleshly or sinful side, it's all about your mind. You set their minds on the things of the flesh. There's nothing that you do apart from your mind being focused on it first. Well, Lord, I, I didn't mean to do that. You know, all right, so I'm in a bar and it's dark and I'm drinking and I'm, I'm going after somebody I shouldn't be going after and I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing and saying things. But how did I get here, Lord? It's not my fault. Yeah, it is. You set your mind on it. You deliberately went out for that course of conduct. And so uh, you can't say the devil made you do it. Flip Wilson did that in his comedy routine. But uh, the devil's got his part but you did your part. You set your mind on it. It starts in the mind. And Jesus said even before the mind, it actually starts in the heart. Mm. And so it's in your mind, and then it gets into your actions. So those who live that constant sinful lifestyle set their minds on the things of the flesh. But on the other hand, those who live according to the Holy Spirit, under His direction, you set your mind on the things of the Spirit. One of our brothers is not here today, but he told me the other day, he's about my age, and he was saying, I not only read the word during the day, but I have it on at night when I'm sleeping. And he says, I cannot afford to not have the word going constantly because I know that if I don't, I'm going to get into trouble. And that's a very wise man for sure. Uh, we need to be able to set our mind on the things of the Spirit. How do you do that? How do you set your mind on the things of the Spirit? Like, what can you do daily to get your mind on the things of the Spirit? Well, I ask for the Holy Spirit a lot. If you notice that, everybody knows that here. So I pray for that. And I, you know, uh, sometimes I don't pray when I should, but when I do, gosh, it works so quick, right? Um, so yeah, prayer, right? She gets up in the morning and goes right to her prayer chair. Starts with Psalm 91, starts praying for the family and the, the church and the world, and uh, that's it. I don't care if the house is on fire, it's going to have to wait until she finishes <laughs> with her prayer time. And uh, that, that'll go on for a better part of an hour. And then she's praying throughout the day. So prayer is one way you can set your mind on the Spirit. What's another way we can do it? Can you sing to the Lord? Reading the words, Robin Can you read the said. Word? Can you read the Word? Can you uh, hang out with the right crowd? Christian radio, that, that can be kind of... Uh, questionable at times. Be careful what you listen to. Uh, when I was young in the Lord, uh, there used to be Bible teaching on the radio. Now it's mostly uh, counseling and an awful lot about nutrition, uh, well, which, which can be helpful. But I'm just old-fashioned. I like the Word of God. Because it's and, pure. It's pure. You know, and, and I don't want any politics mixed in. Politics is over there and the Word of God is here. Let's not separate. Let's not bring the two together. And so watch where you're, you're thinking. Watch, watch your actions. Watch what you're what putting into yourself, uh, what you're listening to, uh, your ears, your eyes, uh, all of that. What's going in? Because garbage in, garbage out, right? Spirit in, spirit out. Verse 6, to be carnally or fleshly minded is death. It means separation. Mm -hmm. Death means separation. I don't, I don't feel you, Lord. And he might be saying, so what are you thinking and what are you doing? Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Be carnally minded, it's death, it's separation. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
We all want life and peace, Amen. but you can't do it by being in the flesh. The carnal mind, that's the fleshly mind, is enmity. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's in, uh, in contrast with and it's uh, at war with God. It's at war with God, that carnal fleshly mind. Well, I'm going to try to make my carnal mind better. No, you can't do it. It's sinful and there's no way it's going to come into uh, agreement with God. It is not subject to the law of God. It's rebellious, nor indeed can be. When mm. you see sin, it's nothing but rebellion. Put all kinds of names on it. You can put all kinds of medical and mental health diagnoses on it, but sin is sin is sin, and rebellion is as the sin of... Witchcraft. Witchcraft, But right? sin isn't popular anymore, that word. You know that, That's right? right? Nobody That's wants right. to use the word. That's right. You, you told me about some lady who came to our church one time, and uh, said, I'll never go back to that church because they talked about the S word, sin. Facebook's going to probably ban me again now. Sin. <laughs> talked about sin. They don't want to hear it. So then those who are in the flesh, they can't please God. You're not going to be able to please God by being in the flesh. can't come to Christ that way, and you can't have a close walk with Christ, even if you're born again. You can't have a real close fellowship. Now, you're not going to lose your salvation. Salvation is kind of like that steel cord somebody once said. You can't sever it. It's a relationship like mother and son. The son can be misbehaving or the daughter. Uh, the relationship is always there. Fellowship, though, is like a thin thread. And uh, sin can just cut it and that's it. That's that separation. So when you are in the flesh, you can't please God. But you are not in the flesh, he says. He's being positive here. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit under the control of the Holy Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You're born again, and the Spirit of God is comfortably settled in your life. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, if you haven't got the Holy Spirit in you, you're not His. Mm. So you should be convicted of sin. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's going to come inside of you once you come to Christ. So again, for the theological debates go over being spirit uh, indwelling, spirit filled, the Holy Spirit comes in all believers. Spirit filled means that you're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Not a question of tongues or theology or what have you. Uh, Pentecostals and Baptists all have the Holy Spirit in them. There is a new dimension in the book of Acts called uh, epi in the Greek, it's upon, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and overflows you when you begin to speak in tongues, and there's a new dimension in power there, uh, fueled by tongues. That's another story. But the Holy Spirit is in you as a down payment or the engagement ring that you are in Christ. Speaking of engagement rings, you've all seen engagement rings, and uh, often there's a diamond as the centerpiece of that engagement ring, and then on that diamond, there is usually a focal point, the highest point of that diamond, which sparkles the most. It's been said about the Bible that if the Bible is the engagement ring of God, Romans, the book of Romans, is the diamond in mm. that engagement ring. Yeah. And chapter 8 that we're in is the point, the highest point of that diamond. Mm. And... It is the greatest, highest level in the whole Bible, right here in Romans chapter mm. 8. So this is the high point. I was looking the other day, uh, when I was 14 years of age, I was in camp and we had to go, at Camp Timlo, we had to go up Mount Marcy. And uh, uh, Mount Marcy is the highest point in New York State. And so I got up there and had a great sense of achievement, as much as a 14-year-old can appreciate it. And I uh, checked out the height of it, 1,533 feet high for absolutely worthless information on a Sunday morning. But that was a great achievement for me for about five or ten minutes. But Romans is the highest point in all the Bible of the glory that we have with God through the Holy Spirit, through mm. the blood of Christ. Well, that's, uh, let's look at verse 10. We've got one more area of freedom. We're free from death, free from separation. Verses 10 and 11. Oh, oh sure. Um, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So when Christ is dwelling in your life, your body is dead because of sin. It's not needing to sin. It doesn't even want to sin unless you encourage it to. Mm -hmm. Remember feeding that dog that's, uh, that you shouldn't be feeding? And so the body is dead because of sin, but the Holy Spirit is life 
He gives you life because of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ in your life. And uh, that's just plain common sense. You do something wrong, how do you feel? Just like Adam did. He was hiding in the, in the, uh, in the garden when God said, where are you? He was hiding. He was covering himself with fig leaves. And that meant nothing to a, an, an Albany boy, but until we had an evangelist from California come out here and explain to me about what fig leaves are. Because not only is it dumb to try to cover yourself, but a California guy who knows about fig trees says it's dumb to cover yourself with fig leaves because they make you very itchy. <laughs> so, oh good, I covered myself. Scratch, scratch, scratch. How dumb we are as we try to cover ourselves instead of going to God and saying, forgive me, cleanse me with the blood of Christ. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the Holy Spirit's in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He raised Jesus from the dead. If you're in Christ, he's going to raise us from the dead. We're going to have resurrection life. If you have loved ones who've already passed on and they're in Christ, they have resurrection bodies ahead of them and so do you and I. And so it, but it also means that we've been raised to a higher level here right now. Ephesians 2 tells us that we're raised into heavenly places with Christ. We, you, we dwell there with him right now. You know, as a nurse, I see a lot of people that are sick all the time, and obviously. But one of the things that I really, I'm always doing my own little research, and I notice that those who really love the Lord, they have life. Not only does that life affect them with their problems and health, but I see the life in them. They're different. There's something about them that's different. And I come home to him and I tell him a lot that I can see the life moving through. It's almost like I can see what other people can't see. Believers have something in them. And that life keeps going, it's flowing through us. And, uh, you know, so when we th th think about sickness, if you're a believer, we have the ability to overcome through those sicknesses, because that life is constantly flowing through us. I look at people who don't have that, and it's almost like there's a river stopped, you know, something stopped in them. And we give them all the treatments we can, and sometimes they get better. But I just, in my own personal opinion, I see people who are believers, something's different in them. There's life flowing through them. And, you know, people are always complimenting him, what he can do for his age. And it's really miraculous, although we're trying to s slow down a little bit. Um, and even my situation, when I tell people how many kids I had and how old I am, they're kind of like floored. And I know it's nothing good I've done, except that Christ flows through us. It's all him. And so when people don't know Christ, they don't understand what they're going to get. Not only are they get an eternal life, but you're getting blessings right here on this earth. That's right. You're going to get blessings all the time. And I can even feel the Lord right now <laughs> saying that. So take that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So that's the first point, verses 1 to 11. We're free in God. Second point, we are the family of God. And remember that song, We Are Family? Yes. <laughs> and uh, verses 12 to 17, we are alive in the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit, we're mm -hmm. adopted by the Spirit, we're children of God, and Amen. we are heirs of God. Heirs. Let's read verses 12 through 17, honey. Sure. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Isn't that marvelous? So we're a family. And verses 12 and 13, we are alive in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. 
We're not a debtor to the flesh. I don't have to fulfill the fleshly desires. I'm talking about sinful desires. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will die. You'll be separated from God, could be separated from others, separated from this life prematurely, all kinds of definitions of death. But if by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice that if you, by the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you're going to overcome the flesh, you must do it by the Spirit, not by your flesh. Not by some self-help program, not by some group therapy, not by determination. Now, there are people who are giving up bad habits every day. They're stopping smoking, they're stopping alcohol, they're stopping uh, uh, lust and pornography. They're just simply cutting it out. Boom, that's, that's good. It's good to stop that activity. Put off. But it does not Put in on. any way enhance you spiritually because you didn't do it through the Lord. And probably you're going to end up uh, not doing that thing but doing something else you shouldn't be doing. That's another story. But the Holy Spirit's got to be the one that leads you. So when you're trying to give up a bad habit, ask the Holy Spirit. You know, I've tried to give this habit up, Lord, and I've tried every single thing, but it doesn't work. Show me, Lord. Be my personal trainer and show me exactly how I'm to overcome this addiction, this behavioral problem, this part of my life which is not right. I can't do it. I've tried everything. I've read everything. I've had all kinds of counsel. It doesn't work. Show me the step-by-step -step process that I need to change. Change me, Lord, by your specifications. He'll do it. So if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. If the Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit in you puts to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. And so you're going to have that life that he wants you to have right here now. Verse 14. We're talking about being led by the Holy Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. They're children of God. Tekna in the Greek. Amen. Uh, are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Again, you can do all sorts of good things. You can read the Bible. You can tithe. You can go to church. You can do good deeds. But if you're just doing that on the natural without the Holy Spirit, that's not really what he wants. He wants to be a part of You know, of you can be led. I don't do this all the time, so don't put me on a pedestal. But you can go to the grocery store and be led by the Holy Spirit in the grocery store. Oh, if yeah. you pray, I've done it before. And so, Lord, help me to minister to one person. And, of course, he gives me a couple. And then before you know it, you're like praying with somebody in an aisle. I haven't done that in a while, but I used to do that. And we should probably get back to that. I think COVID got involved and everybody got nervous about talking to anybody. And while you're being led by the Spirit in the grocery store, ask him what to pick up from the shelf and what not to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Oreos, my favorite. Yeah, Oreos. Yeah, well, Double stuff. Oreos, all the essential food groups right there, right? <laughs> Well, French fries, too. No. Lord, give me with This is your body. This is your, your, your temple. Uh, with all due respect to the food pyramid, which changed uh, three times in the last half an hour as to what's up and what's down. Eggs are in or no, they're out. Uh, milk is in. No, it's no, out. It changes every administration. Ask, ask the Holy Spirit. This is your body. What do you want me to, to do? So when God gives you direction, you follow that. Be led by the Spirit in everything that you do. Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, to teach us about Jesus and to lead us. And that shows we're family. Verse 15, but if you do not did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, or Father. Verse 15 here is talking about uh, the fact that we are adopted by the Holy Spirit. We're adopted into the family of God. Uh, the only natural member of the family is Jesus, of course, the Father of the Holy Spirit, but we have the adoption. You did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear. People who say, you ever hear someone say they don't believe in adoption? I've heard people say that. They don't, there are Christians that don't believe in adoption because of the sin and the genetics, and I get that whole thing, but there are Christians out there. Well, we've been adopted. We've right? been adopted into the family of God. The spirit of adoption has enabled us to say Abba, which really is translated in an affectionate term, Daddy, and Father. Now, there are those who've had uh, bad experiences through adoption, 
but Kelly and I are not uh, examples of that. She we have, adopted well, we have very my, close lives, same lives. Adopted my, her, uh, her dad, Sam, adopted her when you were how old? I, well, I think I was like four, five, and I remember being in the courtroom. But I, I do, I remember the courtroom. But... Um, he was better than I think it was a days. table. It wasn't a big courtroom. It was like table. And, um, but yeah, I was five, but I think I knew him since I was like two. Yeah, but I we fought know. for like 10 years. <laughs> and, but, uh, yeah. and my dad was, he was Uncle Mort when I was five, and I was adopted uh, when I was eight. Yeah. And uh, I then started calling him dad, and uh, he will always be my dearest and closest friend. Yeah. Um, so uh, for us personally, adoption was a, a great success. It was hard. Uh, my father got dementia at the end, so everybody probably knows he wasn't the same man that he was all those years. So I also was grieving him, who he was, while he was alive. It was a really, it's a really messed up thing. The other day, it was a year. Yeah, but um, I will tell you, that it was one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life. Right. I look back and I see how God spared me through so many things and used that man. So we do believe in adoption. Absolutely. But the adoption into the family of God by the Holy Spirit is the most wonderful adoption there is. Mm -hmm. And he says in verse 16 that we're now children of God. Let's read verse 16, honey. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit's bearing witness. He lets you know that you are family that you are the child of God. There's something about the relationship that Christians can have with Christians. We had some dear folks come in this morning to speak to us, and I, I'd met Will uh, several times before, and never met Sandy before. There's a, a connection with, uh, with Christians. Uh, if the flesh is not involved, but the spirit is, there's a, there's a sense of family there. Uh, closer in many times than your blood relatives, to be sure. Uh, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God, and if we're children, then we're heirs, Oh, it gets better than just being in the family, and now you're going to be able to get an inheritance. There are heirs and heirs of God, and oh boy, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. An heir gets, means you get something. There's an inheritance. You get an inheritance, but a joint heir means you share equally. Oh, the lawyer in him. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if, if Kelly and I are heirs, and someone leaves $1,000 to us, $999 to me and $1 to her... That reason, it's reasonable, then that means we're heirs. But to be joint heirs, that $1,000 has to be given how? 500 each, right? And you, that means you and I are going to share in the grace of Jesus Christ. All of his glory, all of his power, all that he has, he shares with us. When I married Kelly almost seven years ago, right here in this sanctuary, I made as part of the vows that all that I have, I de endow. I had to make sure that I really meant that. And yeah, he's that, the most uh, gracious and... But he that, is the most that, giving that man she, I've ever met in my life, I have, honestly. It would be hers. And I know people think you're just saying that. No, truly, he is the most giving man I have ever met in my whole life, next to my father. Yeah. <clears throat> my father was extremely giving to a fault. I've given her a headache <clears throat> she couldn't possibly have believed. To right? a fault. <laughs> so we're heirs with him. All the grace and all the glory. And Ephesians talks about this wonderful, uh, I want to just close with Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, this talks about the wonderful uh, experience that we have right now. God, who's rich in mercy, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. You don't need to turn to it. This is what he has done for us in Christ. Read uh, verses 4 and right on down to verse 10, okay? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he has given us all of that grace, all that glory. You know, I, um, I'm a trophy wife, mm -hmm, yeah. and so are you. Mm -hmm. we, he's, he's put us up there as examples of his grace and his mercy and his love, and so you shine as a trophy wife for the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He has given you everything in Christ, everything. Why wouldn't we want to come to him? Amen? Let's close in prayer, shall we? Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you and praise you. We ask that you would be with each of us now as we 
uh, get prepared to uh, worship the last song and to uh, talk together and to go home, we ask that you would prepare our hearts, bring us home safely, and Lord, help us not to forget what we learned today. Help us to be truly changed by it and change those who are listening or who will listen in the future. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by.